remind uh, everybody, can you speak into the microphones? Because apparently it's a, bit, it's a bit quiet at home. I don't know who the offender is, but it's, it's you know, just a little bit. Yeah, it can struggle sometimes if you. OK, where were we? Um, Councillor Jonathan Pratt, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so I, I know this hasn't been modelled in, 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 in this project, but I wanted to ask about reputational damage. I'm sure, and I don't want to go in the past, it's about looking forward. I'm sure I'm not alone as the only councillor who, uh, if, if refuse isn't collected, I'm the first person that emails, phones, or, or, or a knock on the front door is to go in, right, fix it, it's gone wrong. Um, if you outsource, maybe I could legitimately argue it's not my problem. We've outsourced, it's not the local authority's problem. We've, we've outsourced it, go phone them. But I mean, in reality, it, it, it doesn't happen. If you bring it in-house, yes, of course, it is definitely our problem. But I mean, this is where we are. If, if, if Kia doesn't collect, they contact their local councillors, and, and that's fine. So I'm sure our contracts currently and our future contracts will have penalty clauses um, and, the, uh, and these sorts of things, um, or, or a worst case to the, um, the contractor if, if they're really breaking. And I'm pleased to hear that, 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 that in the main things are going exceedingly well. Um, in the past, has the local authority ever used any penalty clauses in contracts? Um, if we go out, would they exercise them um, proficiently? And what would the local authority do to mit mitigate reputational damage on the authority if a private contractor doesn't fulfil its collection? Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, thank you, Councillor Pratt. Um, I, I think in the main, I, I know you talk about reputational damage, but when we look at the surveys we've undertaken on the waste Waste Savers in Bridge End. We've always scored from residents fairly highly in terms of satisfaction. But don't get me wrong, if you have a missed collection, it's, it's annoying. It genuinely is. When it happens in Cardiff, I feel the same. So it, it is irritating. But in the main, this has been a very well performing contract. And we've gone through um, some of the, uh, the metrics earlier on today. Very few missed collections, um, way, way uh, below, um, you know, well, very good. Uh, exemplar at an example level. Um, do we issue penalty clauses? We can and we do when we think they're necessary. Would we do that in the future if we went to contract? Yeah, abs absolutely. A fundamental part of any service contract like this is that you have to have uh, terms and conditions and clauses in a contract. It would be the same for any contract that we would undertake um, across the local authority. It's just uh, just a good commercial decision, uh, and we would we would do that. Did you say we have exercised um, that in the past? We in have. the last five or six years? Since not since I've been in post, which is four years right. a chair, but I know that we have in past contracts where there has been uh, disruptions and all things haven't occurred, yeah. we do issue penalties against the contract. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bledsoe, please. Thank you, Chair. And, and just to assure uh, both of you again, my, my statement about you knowing a lot of things isn't rescinded by what I'm about to ask you. Um, but I would like to challenge you on one of the, uh, the, the scorings that you've given. It's on page 39 of our report, um, which is around service quality. And the question is, does the option improve the quality of the service offered to residents? Um, I'm, I need some convincing that all three options would have the same score, because and I, I wasn't going to ask this question, but I'm building it on what Councillor Pratt has just asked in the fact that if it's in-house, you have more control. If it's outsourced, you have that barrier there that, that is natural in the fact that the employees are not employees of the council and you lose that element. So I, I, I would need some convincing as to why they're all the same scores on that, please. Yeah, absolutely, and it's a, it's a valid question to raise. The main reason we gave all three options the, the same score for the service quality perspective is that when you look at the, the scope of the contract, 60 to 70 percent third is, is to do with staff delivering the service. When you move from, say, the outsource to in-house or to a local authority company, the vast bulk of the operative will duply transfer to that new organisation. So if you, for example, have issues with the workforce, I'm not saying you do, but in this theoretical 
arbitration, if you did with the outsourced model, they would transfer to oh, that's in house for a LACCO. The supervisors typically transfer as well. So you typically see most of the labor for transfer from one organization to another, whether that's from AMD as it will be to Regend under the in house model or to a LACCO in the other option. So that's where we typically see. Um, that's why we scored them all same there. Um, you can, of course, have you know, different priorities if you're in an in-house model versus an outsource. But with, say, an outsourced model, you can stipulate the specification and saying the payment clauses so that you can focus on the, the key elements from the council's perspective. So if there's a particular concern for you, you can structure a contract and a procurement so that that is focused as contract when it's let in a similar vein to how you in a, perhaps in an in-house model focus on staff so from our perspective that's why we gave the three scores that's great can i just clarify then that you're saying that we could have the same quality of service if the outsource model is managed to the same level that we would do it internally so it cross um, uh, yeah. Across all three models, yes, feasibly you can have the same level of service with an in-house model, an outsourced model, and a LACCO. Um, it all depends on how you manage the contract, how you structure it, and ultimately, like I said, a lot of the staff, the operatives on the ground who do the hard work every day will be the same across the options. Thank you very much for that. I, I said I needed some convincing. You have. Thank you. Janine, you wanted to say something? Yeah, thank yeah. you, Chair. I've um, just been, I have Jen Sparrow online, and um, she just has emailed me an update, really, on that we have actually applied some default okay, yeah. uh, penalties to Kia. Um, and over the last year, we've applied a number of defaults um, due to some, some missed collections and um, some rollouts that didn't occur in terms of, for instance, getting these shops open yeah, okay. when we wanted them to. So there has been a number of uh, default payment uh, just to make you aware of um, the level. The defaults were 25,000 in August 23, and another 25,000 in September, uh, and, and a 35,000 clause in July. But just to let you know, we do use those defaults um, as, as part of the contract um, to ensure that we get, uh, get the service. Yeah. Thanks for the update, and thanks for Jen for the research in the background. Um, yeah. Okay, Councillor. Melanie Evans, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a question, reference page 57, table 3.2. It's the management and staff differences in the LACT, LAC, LATCO and in-house um, proposals. The table demonstrates the difference in the management structure required for the different options, and the report mentions you'd be looking at it employing a HR manager, a payroll officer, a transport manager and a performance manager, etc. Now, whilst I understand those two options would result in managing people rather than contracts, could consideration be given to aligning managers into shared roles to stream them to streamline to streamline it even further? And also another question, with reference to the performance manager, what or whom would they be performance managing? Yes, thank you, Councillor. I'll take this one. Um, so in terms of aligning the management structure, we've done this work with Bridgend officers looking at uh, which roles could be shared and which roles need to be kind of dedicated to the camp contract. That's why you can see on this table that some roles are actually part time. So there would be shared uh, roles within the council. Uh, and working, for, for example, on the strict lending as well. Um, and that's why, uh, in some occasion, there was no need of a full-time person. However, for example, for the transport manager, we did look into that as well. But we looked at the number of vehicles that a transport manager could have, and it was 50 maximum when we added uh, the vehicles in this contract and the, what that the council had for the rest of the services. That was too much for um, one transport manager across the whole council, that's why we've applied, uh, we've uh, dedicated one transport manager to the waste collection services. 
question. Oh, yeah, sorry. And then the other question around okay. the performance manager, uh, that is someone that would review the performance of collections, so kind of it's really working on the efficiency of the services, so being able to make sure that the service that is being delivered is as efficient as it can be, um, reviewing the number of collections per day, uh, and making sure that those collection rounds are uh, as efficient as possible, uh, and keeping this up to date. I don't know, Janine, if you wanted to. Yes, please, please, if I may, Chair. Um, I think the piece about as well, Councillor Evans, about the transport manager, if all we've got to remember is we've got this six weekly cycle of inspections. I mean, that's an, an enormous undertaking just in itself uh, to ensure that the fleet are rotated through the inspection piece. I mean, the effects of fix, the fleet comes back in and it, and it operates, operating. I mean, because, of course, if you think about it, the waste service is, is the one that touches every resident in the borough. It's a borough-wide service. It's enormous. The hundreds of thousands of, of interactions. So to having a dedicated transport manager here is essential, really, to ensure that the, the vehicles are where they need to be and, and manner is right about the performance. You know, we need to continually monitor the performance of the contract and make tweaks where we need to. Uh, sometimes when we have issues where we can't get into streets, we need to change it to small narrow delivery, uh, you know, uh, um, a collection fleet, you know, so we are, you know, we do need to look at what makes the service most efficient um, and uh, in order we get the best value for this and, and have the most efficient service. So okay. just, you're right, Councillor Evans, to pick those things up. They are two really important posts that, that yes. we dedicated just to this way. Okay. Can I come back, Chair, on that? Sorry. Leave it, please. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, OK, so I, I fully understand that obviously the measure now is on the service, not on the people. Um, my concern would be is who would actually measure the people if it was to come in in-house. Um, and also, obviously, I was just thinking because you've mentioned obviously the six weekly um, statutory obligation with regards to the vehicle inspections and service. Is this a role in six weeks? And do we know how many vehicles are scheduled to be out of service at any one time? And should there be a maximum number um, of vehicles off the road at any one time to be serviced, thus then not sort of disrupting the service any further? Yes, absolutely spot on, Councillor Evans. That's why we've got those five spares. So uh, the ideal is, yes, it's a rolling program of six weeks. It doesn't stop. It keeps going and going. Uh, so every vehicle gets it inspected every six weeks. Um, and then there's five spares which are knitted in so that when that vehicle goes off, you bring the spare out and you, and you use that until that vehicle comes back. So, yes, absolutely. And sorry, what was the first question again? It was the first part of that. Sorry, Councillor, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't actually uh, take myself off mute then. It was obviously with the performance manager, because you've mentioned that obviously now I understand the performance manager will be measuring the service itself. However, in-house, we will have be responsible for the people. And you've mentioned sickness earlier on before we went to break. And I was just concerned if you bring it in-house, who will be responsible for the performance uh, of the people and measuring that performance of our people? Oh, no, absolutely critical, as we all are in-house. We have to be held to account, and there will be an operational manager which will be responsible for that. Mm -hmm. That's a key part, and a group manager, key part of the service. Mm -hmm. So we will be monitoring the performance of the contract or the, or the service itself out on site and the vehicles, etc., as well as the staff. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's really important, too. Um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. OK, Councillor Nora Clark, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. In uh, the paperwork, it mentions that in all the options, a brand new fleet of vehicles will be procured and the cost funded by BCBC. Um, but if we went out to re-procurement, and I would use Biffa uh, as an example, wouldn't wouldn't that firm have their, their own vehicles? Um, you know, why has it been decided that... Um, th th that the vehicles will be purchased by BCBC. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Councillor Clark. Uh, James, please. Thank you, Chair. So the, the reason that we've gone to that route is when we've helped councils with, with procurements in the past and when we've engaged with the market, the council providing the finance for the fleet nearly always comes out as the cheaper option. And that is largely because the council has access 
do better interest rates than the state, let's say, BIFR in this situation. If you were to ask BIFR to purchase the fleet for you, you would end up paying more because their interest rate, let's say, might theoretically be 6% versus the council 5%. And given the sums we're looking at, of course, that, that is quite a big difference. When, <clears throat> say, the private contractor looks at that, so again, let's say BIFR, they would include that cost within their financial model. And the way they build their costs up, margin, their profit margin, would be applied to that cost. As well. So with a private contractor funding vehicles, you pay more because of higher interest rate, and their margin is then applied to that cost as well. So that's why we've gone to the funding it, because in nearly all instances, it will be cheaper. Yes, uh, th thank you for that, because I, I know that you explained that earlier on. But uh, the point I'm trying to make is that a company like Biffa would have their own vehicles. That's, that's the point I'm making is, you know, if they're a, a company in um, already in waste collection and, you know, we've seen them on the road, haven't we, Biffa, Biffa lorries, wouldn't they have their own vehicles ready to go? Yeah, apologies, Council. I misunderstood your query. Um, you are right that the contractors will have, they will have some vehicles that they may be able to transfer, but they won't have enough to move to an entirely new contract because the number that you're looking at is quite, is quite significant. There may be some vehicles, other contracts that are coming to their end of their life that they may be able to transfer, but the preference generally is that a new fleet is provided when you look at the contract so that the, the contract knows they're brand new, they're not going to have major issues at the start. It's a nice fresh start as well for the council. So there might be a little bit of room, but not nearly enough to cover an entire fleet, potentially. Thank you. Okay, thank you. For the record, other waste collectors are available, uh, apart from Biffa. Um, yes, I was just using that as an example, obviously. I was going what I was doing. Um, I will jump in before you, Martin. You, um, where does um, climate change and change into eco vehicles was mentioned in the report? Uh, vehicles eco for between pages 66 and 68. Is, is that obviously the procurement? We've got to decide that route as well. Where is that correct? Jenny, can you just give us a little bit of something on that, Jenny, quickly? For yes, us? absolutely, Chair. Um, one of the uh, things that we have said we will do is look at what type of vehicles we procure going forward. And as a council, we have. Um, you know, we are very committed to the 2030 agenda. Yeah. Um, and so as part of this, we will have to look at, will they be diesel vehicles again? Will we move to some electric? Yeah. Uh, and, and in the past, Chair, we've even looked at, would uh, hydrogen be an alternative? The one thing I will say, though, Chair, again, I will bring you back to our um, MTFS and our challenging budget position. Yeah. So what we'll have to do is absolutely look at whether we can bring in low emission vehicles, but also we have to be able to afford to buy that fleet. Um, and just to give you a very quick headline, uh, normal uh, reference collection vehicles are about 250,000 each. An electric uh, 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 collection vehicle is 350,000, and a diesel one could be nearly half a million. Mm -hmm. So there's um, also a lot of our vehicles are bespoke um, chair. Mm -hmm. So the reference collection vehicles, the ones where you put the rest in the back and you compact it, that's a pretty standard vehicle. But all of the other vehicles that come around our county that have different slots in them for different recyclable materials are bespoke. They're bespoke for our need. Mm -hmm. So again, there's a cost of, of, of that. So yes, we would ideally, we would love to move to uh, an ultra low emission fleet or a zero emission fleet. However, again, those decisions are to be made. Um, and then, of course, we have to look at, at the cost of those as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Martin Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. It's not uh, coordinated, but it does all work quite nicely. Um, I get the advantages of, of us purchasing the fleet. It does make a lot of sense in many ways, um, particularly, you know, it depends if we're going to borrow or not, but assuming we weren't going to borrow and we would have capital reserves to purchase the system. Clearly, it would give us essentially a, a discount on the revenue cost of, of, of the future service, which we could then use capital to take up. And and I think something that's not in the report, and if it is, I miss it, is that what it does do is lower the cost to entry to the market. So, so in, in a future procurement exercise, smaller players would, would potentially be able to give a bid in because they wouldn't have that high cost of capital to overcome. But it does have downsides. And um, my concern 
and, and Councillor Pratt talked about control and reputational damage, is if we're providing the fleet, and I guess the same is true of, of, about the Plan B contract we're about to enter, and it's a shame we can't talk about that today, do we then lose control of, of the contractor insofar as we're giving them an excuse? So when the lorry breaks down, if, 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 um, if six weeks uh, inspections are missed, and the rest of it. So, so I, whilst there are financial advantages and procurement advantages, which I, I you know, I, I, you know, quite keen on, are we are we losing control of the other side of the equation through, um, again, giving giving them opportunities for excuses, right? James, so. if the kinhead come back in, please, James. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. It's it's a very valid question to ask. Um, if you have the contract, so if the council were to finance the vehicles and then hand them over to the contractor. What you would typically see is the clauses within the contract to protect the council um, operationally and reputationally, so that the council funds the vehicle and then they hand them over to the contractor. The contractor is then what we typically see responsible for the entire life of the contract period, so eight years, let's say, to so ensure that they're running operationally, they're efficient. If they do not look after the vehicle sufficiently and that causes problems, contractor would then be liable and contract to replace them, do remedial works, etc. So in that scenario, the council does still have control because the onus is very much placed onto the contractor to manage them as if they were their own, even though the council ultimately owns them and purchased them. Sure those vehicles then yes, under our issues or we, so we got to be part of the contract. Yeah, the contractor would then ensure the vehicles. So they are responsible if, for whatever reason, say there's a fire. We, we've seen this in other counties yeah. where the fleet has burnt down. Yeah. The contractor has to manage that mm -hmm. because their insurance should cover that if they've done everything they need to. Okay. Uh, you've been very patient. Uh, Councillor Graham Walter, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to <coughs> sorry, take us back a little bit to the uh, LATCO model that was outlined on page 37. Um, and the background to, to what I'm about to say is obviously on the 6th of April, we see changes to legislation in Wales where businesses are required to recycle to a, um, a standard. Um, can I ask if the um, financial model that's been presented for LACCO assumes zero third party income? And secondly, do uh, does Janine and do our, our friends um, from the consultancy consider that there is a potentially significant opportunity here to be offering services um, in order to help businesses to comply with to comply with those legislative uh, requirements, um, which could make the LACO um, business case or, or financial model a bit more compelling? Thanks very much. Please. Yes, thank you, Councillor Walter. That's a really good question. Um, it isn't currently built into the to the cost. However, you are right. In Wales, um, from April six, businesses will have to recycle uh, in separate streams all of all of their waste, and a LATCO model would give us an opportunity to do that. To uh, look to provide, dare I say, a commercial service, um, as would uh, any procured service as well. Actually, well. To be fair, we could probably look at it for for all three in fairness with an in-house service, but we might need more more capacity. So absolutely, it isn't excluded currently, but that isn't to say we couldn't look at that moving forward. Thank you. Um, can I come back, Chair? Yes, please, Graham. Yeah, yeah th thanks, Janine. That's really helpful because um, I'm not saying I, I, I favour it, but I, I just think it's important that we all understand that I mean, you've said all three models could incorporate it, but this one to me on the face of it looks the most likely, the most flexible, the, the one that would give us more opportunity to seek commercial revenue streams to, off, to offset the overall cost uh, of operating our primary objective here. Um, and uh, I just wanted to, to see if other people agreed and if that's something we ought to take into account when looking at the financial position. Thank you. Okay, yes, I, I think if, if I may, if I may, Chair, yeah. you are right. The LATCO gives us more opportunity to look at that 80-20. 80% has to be our own work, but that 20%, yes, 
we could look to be more commercial with that model and, and generate income to offset the cost of that service. So yes, you're, 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 you're very right there, Councillor Wolf. Okay, thank you, Janine. Councillor Bletzel, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just very briefly, I want to just return back to costs based around vehicles. Um, page 55 of the report shows the graph which has the vehicles and equipment based uh, built into each uh, annual uh, amount on there. Now, and I, I need some form of understanding on this. In relation to, it shows vehicle and equipment being 2.55 million, which is part of the 9.3 million on the re-procurement, and it's pretty much the same across the board. Um, is that an annual fee? Because from my understanding of what I've heard is we're going to need to provide this fleet at the outset. So is the administration here going to have to find £2.5 million multiplied by X amount up front? Um, because that's going to be a challenge. Um, what, 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 what figure are we looking at here? Because £2.5 million doesn't make sense in my head if I don't know the context it's meant in. And just a supplementary to that, does that include the cost of the six weekly checks that we have to do because they're our vehicles? Somebody has to pay for that. Who pays for that? Is that built into this model? Um, so what does 2.55 or 2.65 million pounds mean in, in reality on this? Because 45 vehicles up front is not 2.5 million pounds. Yeah, thank you for this question. So within those costs, you've got built in the capital cost. In terms of capital costs, what we've done is we've assumed that we didn't, would not uh, have all the capital at the beginning to just pay for all the vehicles. So we've assumed that they would uh, use prudential borrowing and that they would spread across the capital costs over uh, eight years. Uh, so there's, we've built in a prudential borrowing rate of around 5%. So you've got uh, this capital cost for all the vehicles uh, that's spread across eight years uh, plus a 5% interest rate. And then within this figure of 2.5 um, million per year, you also have all the maintenance costs, insurance costs, so all the costs uh, including the um, six weekly checks, so all of this is included. Um, we could, um, I, yeah, I'm not sure if the report shows this level of detail, but we could very easily pull that out and show um, what is within this 2.5, uh, what is this capital cost, and actually pull you out what it means in total capital cost over the eight years, uh, what's going to be, because you're right, 2.5 million is, that's, that's not the, um, the total for all the vehicles, that would be a lot more, um, and then what it means the rest in terms of maintenance, um, insurance costs. Uh, does that answer your question? Does make a point in yeah. Yeah, absolutely, just because the, the, the cost of replacing all these vehicles is going to be uh, in, in the tens of millions yeah, of um, coming yeah, forward, yeah. depending on how we make them up um, and what um, energy source we use, whether it be electric or et cetera, it depends on the cost of the vehicle and how bespoke and how many we need. So absolutely, we will, as Manon has said, need to spread the cost of that over uh, the uh, the period the period of time. That's basically, all the consortium costs is in that two point. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. That's five, uh, years, you said, yeah, yeah. Eight years. Eight years, yeah. Yeah, an important part of, of the contract is obviously is, is the leaseback. Okay. Lease okay um, can I just can I just be clear? Sorry, Chair. So to be clear, we're looking at borrowing in order to buy the capital on a assumed cost of 2.55 or 2.65 million pounds over an eight year period. So our capital outlay is based on around about 20.4 million pounds. <laughs> Sorry, no, just to clarify, um, I think I don't have the, I could find the, the figure in a minute, but within this, you also have the maintenance, the operational cost of the vehicles. So I would, I think the capital cost within this 2.5 is actually 1.5. So you have to do 1.5 times 8, which is uh, 12, 12 million. So it's about 12 million. But of course, it will depend of uh, if you go for electric vehicles, that would be um, more. But yes, around 12 million of capital costs you're looking at. And the rest is annual operational vehicle costs. Okay, thank you. Councillor Spandick, you want to come in? Right, that as well. That's, there's no assumption there. I'm saying it will be, but it could be financial wealth government for going to low emission vehicles and these yeah. that's yeah, not taken yeah. into account that's, and knows anything yeah that's assuming yeah. we pay the full okay hopefully there'll be 57 grand okay um did you, did you raise your hand again then 
Do you? If, if nobody else has a question, well, I have a different question. Go on then, go on. Um, page 50 of the report talks about 2 p of staff over from Plan B. Um, is that just what has to happen regardless of the contract that we have with Plan B, or is that because of the contract we have with Plan B? Because we, ha we haven't seen that contract. So is it a case of, because I know it was mentioned earlier by yourself, Chair, that we've made that decision to, to go outside rather than keep it internally. Mm -hmm. Now that we've gone out, is any barrier to coming back in-house the implications around 2P? Because if it is, then that's a consideration that we're going to have to make. We, just to clarify, we, we haven't seen this Plan B contract, so I don't, I don't know, if, have you seen that contract? Did you use that in any way to, to, to get to draft this report? Thanks, Chair. No, so we haven't seen the, the Plan B right, contract. Um, from the perspective of the future, there's, there are no barriers to Bridge End making a decision to go from Plan B outsourced to in-house mm -hmm. with regards to 2P. Mm -hmm. What would happen is the staff would transfer on their existing terms and conditions because under the legislation that is protected. So you couldn't, for example, slash a salary from £1,000 to 20000 because legally the staff are protected in that regard. So mm -hmm. any terms and conditions they have with Plan B, which they likely will have inherited from Kia, would then transfer to the council. If you were to look at improving conditions, so for example, the LGPS, or look at that, um, again, that starts to get very legal, so I'm going to tread lightly there, but mm -hmm. the lawyers will be able to... Mm -hmm. Clarify that. Just to be, just to clarify, two P rules are only applicable for one year after the, the transfer, if I'm not mistaken. Because a lot of companies, they, they go out, and then they, they two P it over. The, the, all the terms and conditions hold for a year or two. Then they they serve notice on the workers and change all the terms and conditions. That's my understanding of what's happened in the. Yeah, not just you, I swear now as well. You know. Absolutely. So, in terms of the time period, I. I can't remember the top of my head, so we would need to check. Yeah, but yeah. you are right that after that period, I believe you can change the terms. So yeah. you can start to negotiate with the unions and yeah. workforce to yeah, yeah. change their, their T's and C's. But, but coming in, they would the opposite work coming in? We, we, they, they'd, be, they'd be rigid for that, whatever that period is, the 2P period. And then we could either change the contracts up or down, whatever we need to. to obviously, we need to, everyone to stay the same, don't we? You know, we, you know, we can't have certain drivers on, you know, 30 grand and it's on 22, whatever it is, you know, you, 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 we don't, but that would be, that would happen for the first year or two of the contract, mm -hmm. wouldn't it? There'd be disparity between some equal sort of workforce members, mm -hmm. isn't that what I'm saying? So, yeah, you might need to do a bit of, I guess, harmonisation of the yeah, workforce absolutely. when you look. In terms of the modelling, I believe, where salaries have been higher, we have models that if, you say, you were to bring the contract in-house and a salary for a driver was higher than what Plan B will be paying, we will have modelled that. It's a beneficial improvement yeah. as opposed to one that would be yeah. perhaps negative. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, so you can, where it's a benefit, I believe you are covered to do that. But again, I, I would defer yeah. to lawyers um, yeah. just to Yes, thank you, Chair. I've just received um, a, a text and um, from Kelly. <laughs> she's not actually in the meeting, but she's uh, she is listening she's online. Listening, is she? um, Welcome, Kelly. Um, so, <laughs> two P is the law, is what Kelly is telling us. So we have to abide by yeah, we that. Know, yeah, we understand that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and happy to help um, to join in help. So if you did want her to come in, chair in. Yeah. To answer some questions. Yeah, yeah, she, we, don't, we just, would be happy to. We were talking generally there. We know the, the period. Meeting. We don't, you know, we, we, we're in a, it's just a general sort of how it works. We're trying, trying to get the bottom of yeah. Not the, you know, exact legal sort of definitions at all. Dr. So, yeah, you, just, I mean. Jumping over your colleague there. I know, he's fine. Next, mind, right? He's fine. It was, it was just to clarify my point, and if, and if Kelly does want to come in, I, I would welcome that because I, employment law is extremely complex. Yeah. My, my misunderstanding perhaps on this is that we had a fixed term contract with a supplier called Kia, which has come to an end. We then enter another fixed term contract with a company called Plan B to provide a service. And we may consider, we may consider bringing that service in-house at the end of that fixed term. And my, my, I, I emphasize the word fixed term for a reason. 
if that fixed term comes to an end with a private company, are we legally obliged to two P staff in if it's to do the same service? That's what I just need to understand, and I don't know if, if there's a right answer because it's extremely complex. My, my, my basis around is around the word fixed term because everyone enters into that agreement at the start understanding what the term is. I, I can, opinion, see, I I can see Kelly's on the they screen. Say, they do, but I'm going to let no, no more knowledgeable people answer that, please. <laughs> Benin, do you want to come in? Or you, no? Okay. Sorry, Chair, we've got, we've got Kelly as joining oh. us now, thankfully. Kelly, please. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, Councillor Brett. So, so two people would, would apply whether it's a fixed term um, or a long term contract. Um, it, it's... Can you introduce yourself? Kelly, can you introduce yourself first, please? Apologies, Chair. Uh, Kelly Watson, monitoring officer, head of legal for the council. Thank uh, you. So yeah, so yeah, two two P would apply. Um, you can't contract out to two P. So regardless of whether we were with Kia or Plan B or another provider, if we took it back in house, two P would apply at that stage. Um, and equally, if we remained outsourced, two P would apply, and the workers would transfer to whoever the new provider would be at that point. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. <laughs> um, Councillor, and this is the last question that we're going to take on this, uh, I think. Councillor Martin Williams, please, your last hand up now. Thank you, Chair. I was going to suggest that it might want to be the last question. <laughs> I, beat um, to, I beat you to it, Martin. There were two, though, Chair. I mean, the first oh. one, the first one was, um, uh, the first one was um, really market risk. And, 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 and what I mean by that, I guess, is market failure. You, you, you've highlighted a number, you, you've spoken to a number of established contractors and and you've highlighted some of those um, like Veolia for example who are concerned perhaps about uh, contracting with us because of the basis that the way we do things practically not the way we operate and work ethically um, but I, my view is that um, perhaps we've underestimated that market risk um, my understanding is that when Kia uh, awarded the contract back in 2017 they did so effectively because they were the last man standing compliant bid. And, and I'm not quite certain what the situation was with Plan B, and, and it's probably confidential anyway. But it, 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 I am concerned that we might end up going down a route and someone effectively either we can't contract, and I know you're going to say that's mitigated by starting early. Um, uh, we can't enter into contract, or we end up into contract effectively by default, and, and we're not in a place that perhaps ideally be. And so really, it was just to, to ch check um, director or confident uh, that we will be able to do that if that's the route we go down, and we would end up in that place on the best commercial terms. And my other one, the final one, is a complete left field question. We've had, going back to my very first question about different options, have, have we not considered or would it be lawful to consider procuring an existing company and running it as an arm's length subsidiary? And that's my last question. Yeah. Thank you very much, Councillor Williams. Green? Yeah, I'll, I'll take the second question first. I don't think we uh, are we going to procure companies, but I don't think we could afford to do that, um, Councillor. And I don't think that we could procure a company which made a profit because we're not allowed to make profit uh, as a local authority. I, d I don't think we could do that. Um, and then with regard to the piece about risk, well, there's risk in all the three options. Yeah, there is a procurement risk, absolutely. There always is when we go out to procurement. Mm -hmm. But as I said, yeah, set out in the report, there's mm -hmm. risks with uh, an in-house option as well. Um, in terms of uh, the staff and the, and the cost of it, uh, in terms of uh, you know delivering that. And similarly with the LASCO, I'm afraid, I think there's, there's risks in all of these options going forward with, with the way the service. So I'm not sure I can I can I can uh, go through that any further than I have. It is set out by you know me where they see the the risks lie, um, but yes, there there would be as with any procurement a, a procurement risk absolutely. We okay. try and mitigate that by going out as quickly as we could, uh, if that was the option that was chosen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, if there are no further questions, then I thank the invitees, especially you know I, how do you pronounce it? You know me. Tonight, and you know, Mr. President, and I'm sitting out through all these questions. You, you fair play. I thought you might have bailed out before now, but thank you very much. Um, you can, you're all free to go now if, when, when you're ready. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you, Chair, and scrutiny. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to Mark at the back. He's uh, been being quiet up there. Oh. You could have come in if you wanted, Mark. I would have, I would have, I would have allowed that. <laughs> On this one special occasion. <laughs> Screen has gone off again. Okay. Michael John. Okay, they've all left now, so we're, um, we're now on to conclusions and recommendations. Has anybody got any comments before we um, try to form a recommendation? For Cab Remember, Cabinet is sitting on Tuesday next week to discuss this, so we have an opportunity now to put our, <coughs> our thoughts and recommendations to the Cabinet before they make a decision, which is not always the case with this committee. So it's not a unique opportunity in a way. So it's very important. So I, the first hand I got up is <coughs> Councillor Martin Williams. It, it was a legacy hand, Chair, but uh, oh, as I've had it, uh, well, it's um, so good, um, I, I, I think we need more information to make a, a informed recommendation. My recommendation would be that we seek that. I, I, I'm concerned about two things, really. Um, one, and I didn't use the word moral earlier, but I think there is a moral uh, issue about really what's pushing this report towards uh, outsourcing is that we treat a certain cohort of people who work for us worse than everyone else. And I, and, uh, and I personally have a little bit of an issue with that, and I think the public would have a big issue with that. And, and, and I, so I think that needs that certainty. Um, but my other concern is what really what I opened up with. We don't really know what basis we're comparing those three options. Mm. Um, and, you know, a, a, a reimbursable contract, for example, would be outsourced, but with this huge control, but potentially financially, uh, or you could go to the other end of the spectrum. And, and I think those options need to be ex explored. Yep. Equally, equally, the last call, and I think Councillor Walters, as he continues talking, it, that was becoming perhaps more attractive. And I do think there is something in that, that potentially we could find a middle ground where some of the existing internal services are two feet into the LATCO and the plan B is two feet into the LATCO and we, we create, a, you know, whether it's the full council terms and conditions or, or a hybrid terms and conditions that are attractive. I, I just don't think there's enough work there for, for, for us to give mm. advice beyond please find out more. Did the, um, I did ask the question, didn't I? Um, would you be able to have the L LPG, no, the local government pension scheme in Alaska? And she did say yes, didn't she? So I'd be far more comfortable with it if that was the case, because what what will happen currently is that it'll, it'll go to Alaska, it'll be two feet over, whatever conditions are, and then they would be changed. They wouldn't, they'd never be in the. And as you say, that's the difference in the contracts. Really, it's three, four hundred thousand, whatever it is. It's on other people's. Pensions. That's the way I see it anyway, and uh, I look forward to other comments from the committee. Councillor Jonathan Pratt, please. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Sorry. No, yeah, um, yeah I'm still not, not stuck, but still this basically comes down to whether <laughs> we want to pay local government pension scheme or not. You know what I mean? Because that just seems to be the big, big yeah. barrier. Um, so, I mean, they're all legitimate options. There's nothing, you know, really in it, you know. Apart from that, I mean, if we outsource, it's not our problem. Um, local government pension scheme, they'll have their own pension scheme. They pay into that. Um, the LATCO, it's a choice. 
you know, it, do we have a two-tier em, em, employment system um, or do we not? We'll, we'll offer the local government pension scheme. Of course, if we bring it in house, you, you have no choice. You'd have to offer them that pension. But um, barring that, I mean, I, I, I did dismiss the LATCO when I was reading the papers last night, but listening to it and, and given the, um, it would have to be a cost and benefit um, a, a, a project to see whether it is viable and I don't have that here mm -hmm. and it's not been presented to us but given our financial um, and our MTFS the ability to create funds is, is, is very enticing um, so the LATCO is you don't have to. It's an 80 20. So you're protected by what you you have to do. You can't make any more than that 20%. So it has to be, you, you have to collect, and that would be the bulk of, of that company's work um, to, to collect household refuse. Um, maybe I went a bit far on taking over Neath Batolbet's um, um, refuge because it wouldn't work with well, the 80 20. In but fairness, it, we didn't know that. It, no, 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 no. I didn't, I didn't uh, really. Uh, cause that, yeah. he, but he talked then about you can do it, didn't he? Yes, it? yeah. So, but you know, obviously, the 80 20. Now, Councillor Walter brought up an interesting thing on, uh, and, and of course, he is right, on the 6th of April, businesses now yeah. have to. That, that surely would fit into that 20% compared to the amount of units we have that are households. You know, the, the businesses in, in Bridgend, surely that meets that. I, I would have a, 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 a guess at it, that that would meet that 80, 80 to 20% model. If that doesn't work with the LATCO, you can still just run that company. It's just hands off it. So mm -hmm. it, it's effectively in-house anyway. You've just created a different bubble for it with opportunities as and when they, they present themselves. Mm -hmm. So the more I've listened today, the more potential I see in that LATCO than any other the two options. And that's my view. I don't know whether Thank I'm persuading anyone else. Interesting. Thank you. A couple of quick things. When I read the report, um, I had a similar conclusion to you that the, the LATCO didn't jump out to me at all. But it's changed a little bit this evening. This is why we none of us are um, predetermined before we come in the room, isn't it? We listen to what they've got to say. And um, it would be, I know, I'm Deputy Chair of Cairo Development Trust, and I know getting a waste picked up is a, is a right bind now. But I dread to think what's happening on 6th of April. So if we, could, if we could offer a affordable package of waste collection for businesses, could that offset the money to give these people a proper pension and work for the lab core? Does that, does that make sense? You know, you know, I, I, I'm really struggling with the moral argument that Mark, Mark, Martin just used of the contract difference being the cost of people's pensions. I mean, decisions made that decision made by people who are benefiting from their pensions. I don't think that's, that's, that's morally you know, corrupt, in my opinion. But uh... no, go on, carry on. No, yeah, yeah, no, sorry, I've got problems with my mic then. Um, the, the only issue with that is. This comes in on the 6th of April this year. Mm. We couldn't produce that model until Ooh, 2026, yeah. Yeah. so it wouldn't be a quick fix. No. And I'll bet your bottom dollar that there will be a private entity out there yeah. who will jump all over it because the legislation's changed and yeah. they will see a profit there. But it's whether that two-year period would, 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 would have too much would it already be established after two yeah. years, or is that option still there, or can we provide it at a more reasonable than or, what? Or there may be other options, right? Yeah, not, not only that, there may be yeah. something else we can you know, to, to, to make that little bit of difference in the money. It's yeah. not a huge yeah. amount of money, no, 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 is it, no, no. really, yeah. to make that difference? That, okay, yeah. that's my thoughts and yours. Thanks, Councillor Pratt. Uh, Councillor Graham Walter, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'm grateful to colleagues for um, the, the last two sets of input, which um, pretty much what I was going to say. I think we're talking about recommendations and conclusions. And for me, a recommendation would be that we explore this model further. In as, in as much as um, there is a commercial opportunity, there, there has to be, albeit it might not be for two years on the Welsh government side, but there will be others. Um, and there is, has, has been said, the potential to pay the proper pension scheme, the proper terms and conditions, by offsetting the cost of that with the additional revenue streams. The, it's about sweating the asset. We will have assets 
that are there and probably parked up from nine or well, seven in the morning till six at night, five days a week. And it's just about thinking outside the box and looking to do things a little bit differently. And I say this with some experience. My last full time role, I ran um, an equivalent type of organisation for Welsh Government where we had an asset that was only being used for internal purposes. And when we went out to offer it to external providers, we managed to generate you know, significant revenue within the 80-20 rule. But it was hard work. Um, it was quite risky. Um, and there's no guarantee of success. But long, longer term, and thinking beyond the term of this I'm sorry, I'm struggling here. We're beyond the term of this council and into the one after, if we can develop a commercial mentality, a commercial attitude, and into looking at how we can better use, better implement the expertise and the things we've developed and grown over years, it can help us with the long term problem of our annual revenue. Um, Difficulties. I'm sorry, I'm really struggling with the breathing today, Chair. That's all I wanted to say, but thank you. Thank you, thank you for away. I know you're not very well, so you, you, and you, your input's been fantastic tonight, I've got to say. Um, but we need a recommendation. I, I think the problem, Martin, I think, I'll come to you in a bit, so in a sec. Um, we can't delay, the, the, the delay now is not, we haven't got time, have we? So we've got a formal re, um, recommendation this evening. Now, before this, as I said, predetermination, we shouldn't be doing that. We should be coming here with a, with a clean slate. And I have been persuaded over, I think, to the last court, but it's got to be looked at further. There's got to be there's got to be a clause in there which says that the conditions are right for the for the workers. So we haven't got a disparity between council. They may get more money over there. Don't get me wrong. If that's the case, good luck to them. But it should be in that pension scheme as an absolute minimum for my for my like for my liking. And explore the, you know, the twenty percent. To fund that, we're not asking them to find that money then, are we? You know, there's got to be opportunities in, in that 20%. We've got a good manager in there to dig out these these earnings elsewhere and pay for those with proper conditions. I could morally live with that then. Let's, let's, let's say that. Uh, Councillor Bates, so please. On the basis of that, I'd like to formally make a recommendation, Chair. Um, that the report states that on a number of metrics that going out again to another company may be on paper the best option but in the last two and a half hours we've scrutinized those points we've asked relevant questions and in reality not on paper in reality a different option may be in the best interest of not just the authority but the residents and the staff will be carrying out the service yeah. so my recommendation would be that we don't tell the cabinet which they should do but we ask them to watch the last two and a half hours of questions and answers and they seriously consider that maybe on paper the best option isn't the best in reality. That when they make their decision, which has been accepted, will be a political decision. It's based on what may be best for everybody, not just what's on paper. I second that, Chair. Okay, well, it's been a recommendation. Is there, are there any other recommendations? Uh, I, I would, I would like to think we point them to the last 10 minutes of that um, two and a half hours myself, because that's where you know, I feel that um, the, the crux of the t this evening has, has been uh, has been held. You know, I, I, my opinion, only my opinion, it's only my opinions, guys. You can come in and contradict me. You know, I am, I'm, saying, I'm sure Councillor Evans is itching to do. Councillor Evans, please. <laughs> 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 yeah, Chair, and thank you. Um, obviously, I've listened to every um, all the debates that's gone on. Uh, personally, I don't think this is a political discussion at all. We all own governance, and we are here to scrutinise the three. Eve that this is a political decision at all. We all are looking at the best decision, the best fit for this council for our residents. So, you know, I have mentioned around the fact that with regards to the qualitative assessment, you know, the in-house position, the assessment identifies the market conditions at present are very favourable. There is an opportunity to control, shape and develop this service. There is a low, a low probability of high risk in both operational and implementation, and there is no difference in quality of service whatsoever. 
there is no difference in quality of service. There is, however, a financial risk based on the pension contributions. There, obviously, there is more extensive recruitment required as well. But remember, if they two peed over, we're going to get a skilled workforce. So, you know, from my perspective, I'm not so sure we need to come to some sort of decision and not just pass the buck in this occasion. We are here to scrutinise it. And I think whether we want any further information with regards to the LATCO, I can understand that. But I think we need to put our recommendations firmly and not just ask others to make decisions. This is our opportunity and it certainly isn't a political opportunity. Thank you. You, you um, Councillor Evans, you said all that now, but you didn't put a recommendation because um, at the moment there's only one recommendation on the table, and and if nothing changes, that's when we we look, we look at it forward. I'm assuming. So, well, yes, I would like to recommend that we possibly look at the in-house right. option. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then we second that. On the second, because there's a recommendation. I suppose we deal with this. So I'll come, I'll bring, well. Councillor Martin Williams was next, sorry. Uh, uh, did anyone second that? I didn't, I didn't, um, did we yes, the... chair. yes, Chair, yes, Chair, Colin Davis. It's been seconded by Colin Davis. That we've got two recommendations on the, uh, two recommendations on the table at the moment. Uh, Councillor Martin Williams, please. Oh, chair, if we're going to get more formal about it, I, I was, <laughs> I guess I'm going to amend what Councillor Bledsoe and Councillor Walter said insofar as, and I mean, in line with your comment, that we should perhaps steer them more firmly towards the, the lap co option. Yeah. Um, not as in that is what we think is best, mm. but something along the lines of having listened to everything, we uh, uh, um, we would guide the cabinet to look more closely mm. at the LATCO option and to develop mm. uh, 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 when they consider to develop you know a, mm. a, a, a credible LATCO alternative to to whatever they. You know, but uh, the, the are we talking about is. a clause in that LATCO of? Terms of conditions, it's, it's, it's all going to be explained in, in, in the recommendation, isn't it? You know, I, I was like I said, I came at this meeting pretty much, you know, in house, but obviously there is a financial. We have, we we all know the financial restraints because because we've just had a, a an horrible budget to get through, haven't we? So that's the danger of you know coming in house and it does go doesn't the finance is really affected. Does this lap go and answer that? This I, I think, I think that. that, that Say something like you know on term so that the staff are treated if maybe it may well be that we can offer them better terms there might be bonuses available that aren't available you know in house yeah. but so that staff are not disadvantaged yeah. versus I don't you know. think they would be I don't think but, they would be <coughs> yes, that's say Councillor Evans that's fine you know we, we've got two recommendations we've, I, I, I've got a couple more speakers and we'll have to make a decision then and um, can I second if the proposing if sorry Councillor Williams is proposing an amendment. Are you, propo are you proposing I, an amendment to that? I'd second that. Which is quite exciting, Chair. But yes, I can think I am. <laughs> I, that, that, yes, that, 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 having discussed it's more, all of it's this, a more I would, substantive uh, recommendation. I would be more forthright in, mm. in, in ensuring that the cabinet properly consider a LATCO option. There we go. The words are coming. A LATCO option that does not disadvantage mm. staff versus. What they and would. it uses the twenty percent to fund that. Correct, yeah. We're giving them an option. We're Correct, not just yeah. saying it, you know, because we, yeah. you know, we're all lefties. We, we, we you know, we, you know, we, we do it for. Oh, am I right? Right, Councillor Walter, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, I support and agree with that. And I would make a further um, suggestion that we ask either the consultants or officers to submit to cabinet with the recommendation or to follow shortly um, a case studies best on bet based on best practice where these type of operations have been proven um, and are operating successfully be it in England, Scotland, Northern Ireland or wherever. There will be some some case studies out there and if we can get hold of them um, I'm sure it'll be an um, interesting reading. So thank you. Okay, um... Councillor Pratt, you got your hand up. No, is that are you coming back in again? <laughs> Sorry, no, that was just. A, a, but no, can, with the in-house argument, and I understand where Councillor Evans is coming from. But if you create this tough, uh, um, 
Latco, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing tail component up for some reason. Um, it, it, it's um, you are effectively bringing it in house, but this would allow options that bringing it wholly in house you potentially wouldn't be able to provide. So the option is there for commercialization. Whether you use it or not is a matter for the company and the local authority. You, you know, so it is just. It, what were the risks? I can't remember what the risks were for for lack. Don't know. There was there was a, there was a risks involved, wasn't, wasn't there? Which I can't remember what they were. So what? yeah, yeah, possibly that would be. Right, up, know, yeah, and and I mean, same as any other business, it has the potential to fail. You, you know, it, it's nothing 100% perfect. But you know, I mean, you are just. But then that risk is exactly the same anyway. If if if. if Plan B collapses Perhaps on the we, 2nd of April. Really come you know, back in house. Uh, really you'd contract. have to bring it in house or yeah. have some sort of emergency provision. Yeah, yeah. This would be exactly the same. Yeah. Bringing it in house eliminates that risk because you don't have to bring it in house. If something goes wrong. It's already there. You know. So it's just. But I think I think the commercialisation option at that 20% it, it, is very attractive. Mm. But you're not forced to use it. Mm. And, and that's the attractiveness of it. If you don't want to use it, don't use it. it it's, I mean, if we go back to um, Bridgend bus station at, 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 at budget scrutiny, why aren't we using commercial options to advertise? Yes, why aren't we using that? You know, mm -hmm. but there's no, we don't have to. You, you no, know, no. It, you're just trying to yeah. you know, create cost benefits. Well, or, we, we, well, we haven't had to in the past, have we? As we go forward, we may be forced to do it, might be because we, we need to. We need to fund these things somehow, and that is a way of you know that. And that's the only reason I go with this uh, favour in lack, though, is because we can fund proper terms and conditions for the workers. That's that's, that's my. To be fair, I mean, you know, I mean, m m maybe I'll get in trouble with my party, but I mean, if if a local government pension scheme goes without question, to be honest, if if you're going to employ staff, and they are effectively local authority staff. Give them the pension yeah. rights. Yeah, it, it makes no sense to me. I'd no, be pretty no. angry yeah. if I, if yeah. if I've got BCBC written all over me, and I'm the yeah. one or one of 120 members of staff who don't have that advantage. It, it's. But it does say in the report, doesn't it, that you know you can they can bail out of the. We, we don't want to give them that option. When it, yeah. With the with this Latco, they're in the, the local yeah. government scheme, and no, that's no. it. Yeah, yeah no, 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 no option and, to get out. We can say that yeah. and say, look, no. If you create a, a, a LATCO, you would, you, we would insist, insist that, yeah. that, okay. that, that okay. They, they are given the local government pension scheme. We, it's coming up to court, too, guys, and I'm not trying to push in, but I know you all want to speak. Uh, Councillor Bledsoe, do you want to... Yeah, yeah. That, and that, that's what I, I was saying. I have to go get my car out of the um, yeah, car park yeah. that closes at 7. Yeah. Um, yeah. But this is kind of my concern, and I'm not trying to avoid making a decision. I genuinely feel is we don't have enough information to make a decision or a recommendation. Mm -hmm. I'm being very genuine on that because mm -hmm. when the decision is actually made, there will be a lot more detailed report than we are having at this moment mm -hmm. in time. They're going to make a decision next Tuesday, mate. What, what we say here, and you know that, do you? Absolutely. You know, that, and, yeah. and that's my point. Yeah. I don't have any influence over the cabinet no. at all. None of us do, do we? <laughs> exactly. You know, you know. And, and, and that's, that, that's my point in relation to where we're guiding people to go. I'm quite happy to listen to the debates, mm -hmm. and there's been one proposal based on bringing it fully in-house and another one on LATCO. Mm -hmm. I, I, I can be persuaded on either, mm -hmm. but I don't have enough information in front of me. We've ruled out Reaper Cooper, not I? Chair, Chair, if I may. Um, just to clarify, I believe Janine said that they would be going to Cavanagh in April, so it's not next Tuesday, just to clarify that. Um, and also, um, obviously you've got a number of speakers yet to speak, but I think you're not far apart now with all of the different speakers and whether if you wanted us to write that up and come and circle it back to people tomorrow um, with what we've captured and, and see if there's something there that you can all agree on. But um, do you want to take your speakers first? Sorry, Chair. The, the problem is now, in the meeting, there's been two recommendations. We're going to have to we're going to have to split them somehow tonight, don't we? We can't have, leave this meeting with two recommendations on the table, surely? Can't. You're, you're going to have to. I mean, the, re the recommendation could be that the, the committee felt that both of those options were workable and they needed to be investigated. Is there any apple that? I think, Chair, you can vote on it and you can have a minority view as well. You know, you don't have to just express the majority view. You can say what the majority view was and what the 
additional yep. minority view was. So if you want to vote on it, you can. So. Never I'm going to check because there was a lawful or an odd in heads then when we said, you know, sort of okay. double, sort of headed, you know, um, recommendation, given, given the facts of the LATCO, obviously in houses in houses, there's no, you know, there's no nothing in that, is there? But given the, 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 all the discussion we had about LATCO, including that, there was a lot of nodding heads. We'd be happy with either of them, I think we're saying, That's, you, know, you know, as long as what we said is in there, basically. So can, can you put something together in that respect? Can I come in then, Chair, because I have got my hand up? Yeah, sorry, Nora. Yeah. Right away, go on, yeah. OK, uh, this, I made a notice the 16th of April that it's meant to be going, I think, to Cabinet. But um, I picked up, because um, you mentioned just uh, earlier on, Paul, about the risks for um, LATCO. Yeah. And, I, and I picked up from the commissioning option that in-house and LATCO, the, uh, the risks are financial risks, sickness, vehicle damage, staff shortages and rising fuel costs. Those were the risks of both the in-house and LATCO. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm not coming down in favour of anyone. So, you know, it's whatever the majority feels. The only difference being, Nora, that the LATCO gives you an option to, to mitigate by, by, by getting some money in to pay for those, to, to mitigate those risks, isn't it? That's the only yeah. difference, isn't it, you know? So, are they everybody happy to have like a dual sort of recommendation as sort of just discussed there? Is everyone okay with that? Everybody? Martin, yeah? Anybody dissent? Anybody want to show a hand up of dissent? No? Okay, thank you. Um, Meryl, you see, do you make sense of all that? <laughs> I think we go well, it's, yes, we got what we got. Um, okay, we're on to the forward work plan. We, 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 we knock this out quick. Now, item five, please, forward work programme. Um, yeah, please. thank you, Chair. Please. So, following on from members' consideration of the forward work programme at the previous meeting, the forward work programme from this committee is attached as Appendix A. The Council's constitution requires the corporate overview and each scrutiny overview and scrutiny committee to develop and implement a forward work programme. Forward work programmes should be manageable to maximise the effective use of the limited time and resources of scrutiny committees. It's not possible to include every topic proposed. Successful scrutiny is about looking at the right topic in the right way, and members need to be selective while also being able to demonstrate clear arguments for including or excluding topics. Within the report, there are criteria for topic selection to assist in maximising the effective use of time of scrutiny committees. The draft outline forward work programme for the committee has been prepared in conjunction with the chair, cabinet members, and the corporate director of communities. The draft forward work programme is attached as Appendix A to this report. The SOCS forward work programme will be included in the next report to cost with any updates for each SOCS meeting included. The recommendations monitoring action sheet is attached as Appendix C to track responses to the committee's recommendations at the previous meeting. I'll hand back to you, Chair, for any questions from members. Any questions on the, on the forward work programme? We are some info tonight, haven't we, about meetings regarding um, this waste contract and um, and more detail about uh, how it's all going to work, you know, so that, that's out there. Uh, Martin, please. Yeah, Chair, looking at the Cairo um, Mine Water project on the 22nd of April, that is this year, isn't it, not last yeah, year? Yeah, yes, um, that's the next. That's next will there be enough to talk? I thought that was gone. Is, is that, is there, will, will there be enough to talk about there, Chair? They put it on the report. I think it's because, I think it's because, I didn't clarify this, actually. I was going to clarify this, Martin. Because the work is imminent to start, and it, uh, Mark, I noticed Councillor Alex Williams in a, in a DP that came out just recently, which I backed out of. Obviously, being a Cairo member, I was hoping that the Councillor Bledsoe and Williams would you know, deal with it. So There's a bit of a conflict of interest, really, isn't there, for me to, you know. Um, and they're asking questions about is there enough money, you know, compared to what we had before, to you know, increasing costs. So they're asking questions we can, you know. Um, bring up regarding all that. That's, I, that's, I think it's uh, the reason for it all. Uh, any, any, anybody else? Okay, we're happy with the forward work program. You see, I will. Uh, Chair, if I can come in. Uh, uh, Councillor Colin Davis, please. Yeah, sorry. I, I raised this at the beginning and I was told he was on the forward work program and, and I, I thought he wasn't. And I'm sorry, but looking at it again, I can't see SPF is on it. We talked about it last year. But it's not on. It's not on our agenda for the next uh, couple of meetings. Or oh, am I missing something? I'm looking at it, and I, I just can't see it. Sorry. 
I thought um, the director gave a date, didn't I? Well, I lost the page now. Um, I'm sure I saw something about it. Or was it last well, Councillor Gebby said 19th of June. Yeah, well, I, mean, I was said, looking at that earlier and I can't find a meeting for 19th of June, so I don't know. Or does she mean the Valley's regeneration strategy? Because I, th I think I think she was looking at last year. I think she was looking at the 19th of June 2023. But I can't see it on on our next couple of meetings. And I, re you know, time is running out for this this funding. It runs out March 2025. So we've got we've got just over a year. Yeah. So I, I'd really like to know how much has been spent. And who the, who the recipients are? Any feedback about the process? You know, where's the money going? What's it doing? So, um, you know, we can take Mera. it back to, to the director. Sorry, yeah. and um, would you want that to come to a committee, or do you want the information quickly and and in writing for you to consider whether you wanted to come to a committee? Yeah, that's all I would say. Yeah, Mera. good point. Good point, Mary. Both, I think, because I think we need to know now what's going on, but also I think we need to scrutinise it. OK, so let's get a paper on on it to um, information quickly and then let's see where we can schedule it then. If everybody's thanks, in agreement. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mayor. Davis, that was great input. Um, OK, it's uh, urgent items, item six. Uh, there are no urgent items aware, I'm aware of. So the time now is 18.51 and I'm going to declare the meeting closed. Thanks, thanks Chair. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chair.